Okay. Now what I'd like to do is something uh, that you'll probably cut out because of copyright issues, but it's a kind of fun warm up anyway. So we're going to go ahead and do this and then we'll actually start. I got about a one minute warm up here ladies and gentlemen and we've got Linda Paul. This is like a Vegas show act, okay? She's going to warm us up and we're going to get up and we're going to get into it here right off the bat in our exploration of duple and triple meter. So here we go, Linda Paul. It'll be worth it. It's okay. They can march. And it just goes like this. Kneel the duple. Which foot gets the downbeat, right or left? Left. Okay. All sorry. Left. Didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, and if you hear a triple, your step is this. Down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up. And this is to get you to feel the duple and the triple. So see what you can do. You can do this on your test, too. <laughs> Picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. Somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly. You've got it. A girl with kaleidoscope Okay, we got that. Look for the girl with the sun in her eyes and she's gone. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Okay, so that's our warm up for today. Now from the ridiculous to the sublime, we're going to go to our first slide. And that takes us to the question of sound. We, we have never really nailed this down, I don't think. When an instrument, any instrument, the piano, plays a note, what you hear is one fundamental pitch. You are also hearing very small amounts of other pitches. Usually these get charted out into the so-called overtones, 32 partials or overtones, and you can see them playing out here. The amount of force in each of those partials, we'll call it the amplitude uh, of each of the partials, varies according to the acoustical properties of a particular instrument. So that each of these peaks here represents a particular partial. But you can see that they do not decline in any kind of straight decline. Some of them bump up from time to time, more um, uh, push there, more volume there. So when we hear any particular sound, again, we're hearing an amalgam of many sounds and the particular, the importance of each of these partials in the aggregate of sound is what gives it its particular color. If you've ever worked with a synthesizer, I think in very simple terms here, what an electronic synthesizer does is, t is play with these. They can push down the seventh partial. They can bring up the ninth partial. They can push down the thirteenth partial and bring up the fifteenth and thereby change the sound of a clarinet into a French horn. They play with these partials on each of these notes, but this is just one sound with all of these other things mixed into uh, the, the medley that produces the quality or timbre of a particular instrument. Okay, that's that point. Now, we're going to go on and review a few things that we talked about last lecture. Remember we were talking about beat, which is this sort of regular pulse, the pulse of life, the pulse of music that comes at regular intervals. We were talking about the subdivision of that pulse, the kind of organizing of that 
pulse into meters and that we had this capacity to indicate what the meter was by these numbers 2, 4, and 3, 4 for duple and triple meter. Remember we were uh, just demonstrating, listening to the Ravel Bolero. There we had rhythms superimposed. We had two prominent rhythms up above. Rhythm is simply these patterns, usually repeating patterns of longs and short that get superimposed, as I say, or set up above the basic beat underneath. We also learned from the Ravel's Bolero that nobody actually plays the beat. That's too basic. But our mind, hearing all of these complex rhythms, extrapolates the beat from this complexity. Okay. That by way of a quick review. Now two other terms that we have touched on. What's tempo in music? What's tempo in music? Yes, gentlemen? Pace or speed of the piece. The pace or speed of the, piece. of the piece, particularly the beat. The beat will, will do control that. So it's the pace or speed of the beat. Thanks very much. Uh, we can take a particular, here I'm conducting in three, one, two, 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 three. Obviously, I'm accelerating there. We use the fancy Italian term accelerando for that. We could be going with a very fast tempo, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and slow it down. Obviously, we would be retarding the music, ritardando, or a retard at that particular point. All right, with that by way of background, let's go on to two what we might call rhythmic devices here, two rhythmic devices. The first is syncopation. We worked a little bit with this last time. For syncopation, let's go to the board over here. If we have a particular rhythm, and this is a rhythm, and here are the beats and the meter underneath, we would be coming along one, two, and one, two, da, da. Okay, obviously this is the bar of syncopation. We did this in section last week, but you can see that uh, this note is the syncopated note. It's jumping in too early. We expect it to sound there. So what syncopation is is simply uh, the insertion of an impulse, a, a, a hit, if you will, uh, at a metrical place that we do not expect it to be. Usually the metrical impulse is on the beat, with syncopation, the impulse can come suddenly off the beat, come suddenly off the beat. And it kind of gives it a little snap or ja we, jazzy aspect to, uh, uh, to the music. We talked about that in the Cole Porter last time. Here's one I remember a couple of years ago. There's a clothing store called TJ Maxx. TJ Maxx. They had this little jingle out there. ya ta 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 Just a little bit of, and this, then you were supposed to say TJ Maxx. I'll remember TJ Maxx forever because of this guy's little syncopation. It's in there. We really remember these musical, think about back in your childhood and your nursery rhymes, the capacity of oral material to be retained. Okay, da da da. Here's beat two. It jumps in too early. This actually, I think, derives from a Greek word, syncope, S Y N K O P E. Syncope, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, but it means to kind of uh, cut short, to, to uh, cut short and therefore get in a little bit earlier. Now the master of syncopation, of course, in music was Scott Joplin, African-American composer writing uh, a lot around the area of St. Louis in the turn of the 20th century. You know his music from pieces such as The Entertainer. So let's play just a little bit of The Entertainer very slowly. Um, and I, my question to you is, where is the syncopation? Is it in the left hand of the piano? or in the right hand of the piano? Is it in the bass or the melody? Where's the syncopation? Left hand, right hand? Right hand. Bass is just going, well, what is the bass going? In 
that fashion. One, it's playing eighth notes, one and two and, subdivided into B. Whereas the syncopation, it's there, yati, di, 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 and so on. So you're tapping your foot, you're tapping the beat, and a lot of the music is coming off the beat. Let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can create our own syncopated orchestra in here. We've got an example up here. This is the conception of it. Let's see if we can actually execute it. What I'd like you to do, everybody tap your foot. We're going to do this in four, ju just four, uh, just because I think it works out better. So everybody tap your foot with a four beat. Here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Nice and loud. Come on, I want to hear it. Okay, now take your hand on a chair, your notebook, your computer, or whatever, and do syncopation off of that according to this pattern. One, two, ready, go. Da 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 Okay, good. I see Daniel down here has got this nailed. Okay. So that's what syncopation is, and it isn't much more uh, difficult than that. The second rhythmic device that we have to uh, be aware of in music, we frequently encounter, is this concept of the triplet. Now, most music that we listen to, and here's a good example uh, because it, uh, uh, it plays it out so clearly in the melody, most music that we listen to uh, takes the beat one, two, one, two, and subdivides it into two. One and two and. Musicians like this and business. One and two and, one and two and. So each quarter note has two eighth notes. We could also take the two eighth notes and divide them into two uh, sixteenth notes, and then we get a one ah and a two ah and a one ah and a two ah and a something, something like that. But of course, most, most music, uh, although it operates that way, not all music continues in that fashion. Oftentimes, occasionally, occasionally, oftentimes somewhere between the two, the beat is divided into three. So what I've got here is an example of that. It's actually what we call my country tis of thee, I think. So that's it. I think uh, it's been set by a number of composers over the years. Beethoven set it uh, under the heading of God Save the King, George III or somebody. Uh, no, George III is probably dead by then. Um, who was the King of England, uh, in, let's say in 1810? Who knows that answer? I don't know it. George III would have been dead. Uh, okay, so in any event, we're coming along toward the end of it. So you can hear ya ta 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 pa pum, the triplet being inserted. So a triplet is simply insertion of three notes in the place of two. Not more complicated than that. Uh, here's what we would expect, one da di da, but we get di 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 ya da 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 da. The interesting thing here is that the bass continues along with the duple pattern. The bass is going where the upper voice has. Beethoven could have made that bass go with triplets too. Actually, it's all set up for it. Both melody and bass could have had the triplet. But he chose to have the duple and the bass, the triple up above. Let's see if we can do that. It's a little bit of a challenge for the performer. Let's see if you can tap your left hand to a duple pattern. One, two, one, two. And then take your right hand and do a triplet against it in a triplet pattern. One, two, ready. Go. Ya da 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 one two one two. It's harder than you think, right? But that's the kind of thing that musicians, particularly uh, percussion uh, players, uh, have to be able to execute. All right, now um, an insertion, sort of discourses. We're going to talk a little bit about musical texture. Musical texture. This is discussed in your, in your textbook in example in example 
or chapter six, in chapter six. Uh, texture in music is the dispositions of the musical lines. I was trying to think this morning of an analogy and I thought I, I came up with a good one. It has to do with tapestries and carpets and things like that where you weave different strands in in different ways and somewhere in my deep recesses I have these, these wor words wep and warp or something like that. Does that make any, does that have any resonance to you? No. All right. I think it's out there in weaving. I got to dig it out. I tried to find it on Google really quick and nothing came up. But I think there's this idea of how you organize a tapestry in that fashion. In any event, in music we have different strands and these strands can be organized in different ways. We simplify by saying this that there are, saying that there are three fundamental textures. Monophonic texture, homophonic texture, and polyphonic texture. And to um, e exemplify this, one day it occurred to me, well, why not take a tune that everybody knows, Amazing Grace, and sort of set it in different ways to exemplify <coughs> these three textures. So that's what we've got on the sheet for today. Everybody's got the sheet there. And what I would like to do is just have every one, all of us, we'll just sing La here. We won't sing the text. We'll just sing Amazing Grace. And we'll kind of start it at pitch. Da. Hey, pretty good today, okay? So, so we'll start it at pitch there, and I'll give you two, and then we'll sing La. And we will exemplify monophonic texture. Here we go. One, sing. La, 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 la. Okay, that's all we have to do. You don't have to read the notes because you've got the, the sound in your ears, part of your oral memory. So that's monophonic texture, just one pitch. Actually, was it just one pitch? What do you think about that? How many pitches? Let's do this again. We'll sing it again. How many actual frequencies are we generating here? One sing. La 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 la. So how many pitches are we generating? Really two. The gentlemen are singing in one octave. We're singing below middle C. And the ladies are singing up an octave. But that's still monophonic texture. The, those notes have the same names. We're, I, we're going D, G, B, G, B. So as long as the notes have the same names or it sounds the same, even though there may be octave doubling in there, we st still think of that as monophonic texture. Linda, come on up. We're going to exemplify homophonic texture here. Um, and, and we want you to sing the melody and we'll try to do the parts underneath of it. Homophonic texture is where it all lines up pretty much together. All the parts are changing together. One sing. La 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 la. One more time. We need. A, we're going to get our third in. Ready. Sing. La 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 la. Sweet it is. Okay, so that's ha sweet sounding homophonic texture, mostly just chords. Thanks, Linda. Um, then we can take this and turn it into something a lot more complex with a, a, seeming a lot of lines going their own way. This we call polyphony. We also use the word counterpoint, sort of synonymous with it. So uh, part three down there at the bottom, we've got an example of polyphony where I've taken the tune and sort of set it against itself a little bit. a lot more complex, a lot of independent lines going on up above. Think of one line, think of a group of lines. Here's one sound, here's a group of sounds, different pitches in there, actually three different pitches in there as opposed to just one pitch. 
one pitch, three pitches, or three or four pitches moving in different, in different ways, kind of independent rhythmically. So that's the difference between homo monophonic, homophonic, and polyphonic texture. Now we're going to turn, focus here just a bit more on polyphonic texture because there are two types of polyphonic texture. Uh, the first we'll call imitative polyphonic texture. And here in Amazing Grace we really do have imitative polyphonic texture because you, as you can see, we have in the bass there in bar two, the bass imitating the upper part. And then toward the end there in bar 13, the bass. And I've added an extra note, it occurred to me, hey, I could take that theme and turn it upside down against itself and it would work. So that's called musical inversion. Bach, Bach would like that. He likes these kind of mind games with, with music. So it's complex stuff, this polyphony or this counterpoint. So this is imitative counterpoint because there's one idea that keeps coming back and back and back. Now there's another kind of counterpoint called free counterpoint where it's highly independent lines uh, are sounding, but uh, they're not imitating one an or another. Let's listen to just a section of this. We should have this. It's Louis Armstrong, and we'll talk more about Louis Armstrong as we proceed here. So listen to a good example of, of non-imitative texture, polyphonic texture. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff, huh? Where was Louis Armstrong from? Chicago. Actually, he did his recordings in Chicago, but he wasn't from Chicago. Where's the heart and soul of jazz in America? New Orleans, right, yeah. That's why it's so important culturally for the history of the United States. So what we want to do now is to begin to think about counting measures, counting measures, counting measures. Uh, and we're going to do this by staying with this piece of, of Louis Armstrong here. And we need to be able to count measures so that we can figure out the syntax of music. Music is a language and it is made up of a syn syntax. And syntax, you know, consists of phrases and the order in which those phrases occur. But maybe even before we can recognize the syntax of music, we have to figure out what a phrase is. So to do that, we've got to be able to count measures. How do we do this? Well, musicians, again, have developed the following sort of process. Let's say, oftentimes, orchestral musicians, they're sitting there and they're not playing. So they have to be able to count for long long period of time. So they'll be going along in this fashion. Let's say it's duple. One, two, 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 three, two, four, two. They're just adding integers as on each downbeat. It's a very simple, uh, simple idea. Oops, I may have hit the wrong button here. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Think of these poor French horn players in the orchestra. They, have, they play so rarely and then it's so important when they do play, they'd be out there 78, two, 79, two. 82, 81, 2. You've got to count forever. We won't have to count quite that long. But even before we count, we've got to figure out what the meter of the music is. So let's start with that now. What's the, uh, let's go back, or I guess we're going to go to the beginning. What's the meter of this piece, and then we'll go ahead and count some measures? So it's duple meter. Our brain has got all that stuff coming in there and we're probably focusing a lot on the bass and boom, boom, that tuba that's playing there. So let's go on now. We're going to hear Louis Armstrong himself play. What instrument did Louis Armstrong play? Trumpet, yeah. And he had this wonderful rich sound, but boy, it was, it was a big, huge sound, kind of the ultimate in-your-face trumpet player. So we're going to hear Lou, a solo by Louis Armstrong now, and let's count along once the phrase begins. I'll get you started and then you count the measures. Here we go. Let's start it again. I, I didn't, it started right where, uh, right where the phrase began. Here we go. Ready? What? That's not good. No, just, just go back where you were. That's fine, Linda. That's great. One, two, two, two. Go ahead.
and then he disappeared. So how many bars did you count there? How long was the phrase that Louis Armstrong played? Eight measures, everybody agree with that? Anybody say seven? Better say eight in music. Asymmetry is not the norm in music. So eight's a, eight's a good bet there. Let's go back and hear another solo. It's a wonderful clarinet solo by, by someone named Johnny Dobb, long dead of course, but it's one of the most beautiful, incredible clarinet solos you'll ever want to hear. How long is this uh, solo? How long is this phrase here by Johnny Dobbs? Here we go. One, two, two, two. Sixteen, so twice as long. But that, that, that's, that's sort of good news. A lot of music is made up of these two, four, and four, four uh, sorts of aggregates. Uh, and then we'll just go on to listen to the end of this where everybody's in. It's hard to know again what the melody is or what the phrase is here. It's just everybody playing. Remember, are they using music <coughs> here? Could these gentlemen read music? It's not clear that this particular group could. It's all, I'm sure Louis Armstrong would read some music, but again, it would just get in the way of what he's doing. All of this was, was orally, um, orally transmitted and orally taught. So let's listen to the end of, it's called Willie the Weeper. You're gonna have it as one of your listening exercises. Let's listen to the end of it here. Okay, here we go with our phrase. to call that, remember anybody in high school band here? What do you call that? Do boom at the end. Do you still call it that? Stinger at the end? Sort of a syncopated bounce at the end of the thing. How, how long was that particular phrase? 16 bars there again. And a, a, a perfect example of free counterpoint. You've got the trombone, the clarinet, the trumpet. They're all just doing their own thing in the context of the harmonies that are playing out here. And it's just, it's just magical. Just magical, I think. What happy music, right? How could you possibly be sad when listening <coughs> to that kind of music? And they play this kind of music coming back from funerals. You know, you're dancing into heaven. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, I bet there's heavenly music of that sort. Uh, okay, now let's go on to another thing that we'll want to be doing here, and that, I guess, is um, taking a little bit of rhythmic dictation, writing down some simple, some simple uh, rhythms. How are we gonna do this? Why do we want to do this? Why do we want to do this? Because we want to remember things. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart had a very good musical memory. There are lots of stories about Mozart's musical memory. In 1778, he was in the town of Mannheim. He heard a string quartet by a man named Cambini. It was never published, there were no recordings of it. Mozart goes to Paris. About six months later, he bumps into Cambini. He says, oh yeah, Cambini, I remember you. We, we, I, I heard your string quartet in Mannheim. And he sits down at the piano and plays this thing. You know, he didn't have access. He wasn't studying this thing. He wasn't trying to memorize it. He heard it just once. Six months later, he could remember a whole movement of a string quartet. Another famous story in 1770. He goes into Rome, into the Sistine Chapel. It's Holy Week. He goes to hear the, the well-known Miserere of, of, of Allegre, Gregorio Allegre. Uh, you're not supposed to copy this piece uh, because it's supposed to be only uh, performed in the Sistine Chapel. Mozart in, goes in, he hears it, he and his father walk back to the inn where they are staying. He writes down this four to five minute composition, note for note, in just one sitting. That's pretty scary, wouldn't it be? I, I, I mean, you're just off on a different planet in terms of your capacity to process oral material. But we, I can't do that. I couldn't begin to do that. How much can I hear? Two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, I could probably remember that. And he's hearing multiple parts, not just melody. 
Uh, so we have to come up, we mortals have to come up with some other device and our device to remember things is to try to write it down because my premise here is if you can write music down, clearly you are hearing it, clearly and you, you would have a, a better chance of remembering it if you could write it down. So it, it, it just helps us focus on these isolated events. We're not going to try to remember everything in music, too complex. We're going to focus on the simple salient things, could be an instrument, could be an important rhythm. So let's listen to some more music of Mussorgsky here, Modest Mussorgsky. We had that very interesting piece last time, Polish Ox Cart, where he used this principle of low sounds produce uh, so, uh, sound waves that stay uh, forever and we hear those low sounds first and last. So here we're going to hear another piece from that pictures at an exhibition. It's called Great Gate of Kiev. So let's listen to a little of this, 17 or 1874 I believe or 1870s surely and uh, let's listen to a bit of it and then we're going to focus just on the rhythm. Start conducting. All right, good. Very interesting. Um, th uh, there are two possible explanations to, to this. Some of you are going with a very slow tempo. One, two. One, two. Two. Others are a bit uncomfortable with that. D, 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 D. You're going twice as fast, which is correct. Well, for our purposes, both are correct. And we'll know how to figure this out on test. If you say uh, you've got two measures here and you're writing particular symbols, we'll know that you heard this with the slower possibility. Uh, if you've got four measures and different symbols, you're clearly subdividing the beat but hearing that as the beat. So, so all I'm really interested in here is the idea that that we have a duple meter. Having said that, let's assume that we do have the slower tempo here. One, da, let me play a little bit at the piano. So your hands should be moving rather slowly. Let's all sing it. La, 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 la. Okay, so that's the music. Now, having done this setup, if you think about it and think about the fact that what note symbol gets the beat in our course? Quarter note, okay. Da, so every gesture of the hand is going to be the equivalent of a quarter note. What's going to be my first note symbol? Da, a half note. Here's one gesture, here's another gesture. Da, da, okay? So I've got you going there. You take your piece of paper now. If you, if you want to hum the piece <coughs> quietly to yourself, that's fine. That's good. If I hear lots of buzzing out there, that means you're into it. So uh, hum the piece a little bit to yourself. Mussorgsky's Great Gate of Kiev here in pictures at exhibition and see if you can write down those particular symbols. Okay, let's sing it again. Here we go. Ready, go. La, 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 la. Let's focus. La, la, la. Just on that unit, that measure. La, la, la. Having trouble with this? Look at this. La, 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 la. One gesture, two notes, two pitches. La, la, what should those, what should the rhythmic value of those two pitches be? La, la, yeah, two within one beat would give us eighth notes. Okay, so let's finish it off one more time. Here we go, ready, go. La, 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 la. 
So what should we write up here? I lost my black uh, marker, but that doesn't matter. La, la, la. What should I write next? Well, those are the two eighth notes we were talking about. La, la. Then what? La, la. One note for each gesture. And we've just done a rhythmic dictation of the beginning of Mussorgsky's Great Gate of Kiev from pictures at an exhibition. So you're not going to forget the, this particular melody, and it's because it sounds so grand. There's another reason we're not going to forget it if you focus on it in that way. So when we're, later on we're dealing with symphonies and things like that, you may be sketching little motivic snippets, little rhythmic snippets that you'll file away. All right, let's listen a little bit more to uh, the Mussorgsky, and then we're going to go on just a bit more to the next excerpt. And here's my question for you. You're going to hear the violins play a running scale. If our beat is this, what note values are in the music of the violinists at this particular moment? You don't even have to, to see the score, you can figure it out. So what note, what, what note value are they playing there? Sixteenth, because we've got four impulses for each beat. Let's go on to the next here now. A couple of questions we could ask. The theme comes back. We're going to listen to it again. What string technique are the violins using at this particular moment? And then, and then uh, what rhythmic device does the trumpet insert? So let's focus on the strings first. We may hear this twice. Go ahead, Linda. What are they doing there? What are they playing there? Tremolo. Tremolo. Just kind of filler, right? We, we, we need a big sound here. Let's get the violins to kind of fill in sonic space. It's kind of, it must be something in cooking like that. Use cornstarch or something, a filler, I don't know, just to make, give something body. So this is kind of giving the music body here. It's no, not particular interest melodically. Now, when the trumpet enters, something of interest happens. What rhythmic device is the trumpet inserting? So let's go back to the same spot. We'll hear the tremolo and then the trumpet. Here we go. Notice the, the tempo is slowed down a bit here also. Mm -hmm. same, same passage. So what did the trumpet insert? What rhythmic device? Triplets. Ya pee pee ba 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 ba. So the focusing on rhythm can tell us a lot about the detail uh, going on in pop music or in classical music in particular. Now I'd like to end. I think I have a few minutes here. I'd like to end with a particular piece. Uh, we were talking about Mozart before, and we're going to go on now to talk about Mozart's uh, Requiem. It's a Requiem Mass. What's a Mass? Well, a Mass is a genre of music. Uh, obviously, it's a religious service as well, but it's a genre of music like the symphony or the concerto. Bach wrote a Mass. Mozart wrote many Masses. Beethoven uh, wrote two important Masses, and so on. So it's a genre of music. The Requiem Mass is a particular kind of Mass. It's a Mass, obviously, for uh, death and burial and the commemorance of those who have died. Uh, unlike the regular Mass, the Requiem Mass has a very special movement associated with it. It's called the Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath. It's just a long, long text that's set to music, but that text has, is drawn from apocalypse, the images of apocalypse. And if you ever read uh, the book of Apocalypse or Revelation, you know it's hellfire and brimstone, the day of judgment, damnation, election into the group of the blessed, and so on. So it's a very vivid kind of 
text, a very vivid kind of text. Now, I was going to put that text up on the board, and to be honest with you, I forgot to do that. So I'm going to have to see if I can remember this text. But here's the te- we're going to focus now on the two sections of this work, the Confutatis and the Lacrimosa Dies Ila. They are both uh, subsets of the Dies Irae. The Confutatis, uh, go, the text is as follows, Confutatis maledictis woca woca me cum benedictis. So on one side here we've got the confutatis maledictis. These are the damned. On the other side we've got woca woca me, call me, call me cum benedictis. These are the, the blessed, okay? Ever been to a medieval cathedral? You walk in the front door, Christ in majesty, on the left side are the damned writhing, and on the right side are the blessed, looking a good deal happier. So Mozart may have had this image in mind of the damned and the elect, but he sure was able to set it, this text, through music by using a couple of devices. The the first of these is rhythmic. So we're going to turn now, I guess we'll turn off the lights and we're going to go to a couple of slides here. Let's take a look at the rhythm he associates with the damned. Uh, What kind of rhythm do we get with the damned? Well, we're going to, where would you expect to find the damned? In the high register or the low registers? The low registers. They're way down the 29th canto of hell or somewhere. Uh, so here's what we find. And as you can see there, is this bass rhythm moving slowly or, or quickly? Very quickly. It's going like this. It's also doing what? Going up or down? Up. It keeps rising up. That builds tension. Okay? Are these happy folks singing there? Well, they've got this kind of music. Is this conjunct music, stepwise music, or jumpy, skippy music? Pretty skippy. And is it consonant music or dissonant music? Very dissonant music. Is it major or minor? Okay, so you get about four things he's working with here, but rhythm is very important. Now, eventually, the elect come in, and their rhythm, what do they have? Are they high or low? Well, they're way up high. You can see them in the sopranos and altos up there. And they just sit there on that pitch, a long note. One, two, three, four. I don't have the next page. That's what they do. It's consonant, it's in major, it's high, and most important, the rhythm is very uncomplicated. The notes are long and slow. So let's listen to Mozart's depiction of hell and heaven here. to heaven. It goes back and forth between these two rhythmically very different uh, concepts. Now, Mozart died in December 1791. He wasn't planning on dying. Actually, his death came rather suddenly. Uh, and he was working on a requiem that someone had commissioned from him under rather mysterious circumstances. And he began to think of it as, o- as his own requiem. Uh, indeed, he didn't actually finish it. Uh, Brian, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, Here, from the Austrian National Library, where I was uh, last summer photographing and having a wonderful time, is the last page of the Mozart uh, that Mozart ever wrote here. This is uh, the Lacrimosa sort of breaking off, and he doesn't finish this particular movement. It's the last movement that he was working on, but he has a student there, Franz Javier Sussmeier. And Sussmeier uh, was given instructions and probably sketch pages as well as to how to finish this. So Mozart was able to finish it, and it looks, or excuse me, Sussmeier was able to finish it, and it looks like this. Next slide, please, Brian. 
Here we have a score of it, of the complete uh, piece, and there are just a couple of details that I want to point out here. It begins with what I always hear is a kind of funeral cortege idea. Of course, it's in minor, and the voices will come in, but the bass is going. along in a basic duple but with a triple subdivision underneath of that. And then at the words you can see, well maybe you can't see, but the text is on that terrible sorrowful day we have the words, where is it, qua resurget ex favila, on which resurgent will come forth, resurgent will come up out of the ashes, homo reus, the just person to be judged the just person to be judged. Uh, and notice how it's like the coffin's opening up. And here comes Mozart's soprano line up here. Wow, what a run. But it's all kind of text depiction here. And then in the next page, he's going to take that same rising line and assign it to the basses. Um, let's go on, Brian, to the next slide, and then we're going to go back. Then we have a change of text here. Huic ergo parche Deus, therefore save God, parche, imperative, save us. Pie Jesu, Jesu Domine. And at that text, what he does is shift from this dark minor. And you can write on the words Jesu, he's already. And then he'll work his way back to the minor as the funeral cortege continues, and this time the line will go down instead of rising up. So this goes on for a while. Uh, Brian, if we could go back to the previous slide. We're going to start, we're going to listen to the entire movement. It runs about uh, barely uh, four minutes. So bear with me here, we'll run about 30 seconds over as we listen to the uh, Lacrimosa out of the Die Sire, out of the Requiem Mass of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, written in Vienna, 1791. Nice and loud. the bases to major. Now 
the modulation, change of key from major to back to minor as the cortege will start up again. And then we, next slide, Brian, please. Nice clarinet sound there. Here comes our cortege with the bass. Just a final close, a cadence. So that's the last music of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and his pupil, Sussmeyer. And a little bit, not to leave you in a somber mood, let's listen to Louis Armstrong as we go out. Okay. <laughs> Dancing to heaven. <laughs>